Welcome to the SEC Unfiltered channel. I'm your host, Dave Shumate, breaking down the action that was from the weekend in SEC basketball, going from Friday to Sunday's action, this uh, this afternoon's action. You can see I'm doing this on Sunday evening, uh, posting this back. But guys, we, we had some pretty good action in the league this week. I mean, it wasn't good for the SEC from a perspective of Purdue, Alabama, but in Purdue getting the win, we'll talk about that one in just a minute. But that was a Top 10 matchup on the road. I mean, technically Purdue ranked 13, but still, that was a phenomenal basketball game if you're into actually the X's and O's of basketball um, and stuff just from an overall. I mean, Alabama's athleticism is through the roof. Still a good roster. Nothing to hang your hat on. Florida getting a big win against Florida State. Texas A&M over Ohio State and Georgia. Getting a big in-state win over Georgia Tech on Friday night. South Carolina joined the, the loss club with Alabama. Uh, losing in Bloomington, just a tough start. Ole Miss, I thought, got one of the more under-radar, under-the-radar wins in the league on Saturday. Again, it's flooded with college football, so people don't pay attention. But in South Haven, they got a win against an NCAA tournament team last week. And then Mississippi State rallies past big second half to beat the Utah Utah Utes. But, guys, where we get started, this recap is brought to you by our buddies over at Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SECU at sign up to get – $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. Let's get to it, folks. Purdue beats Alabama. I'm going to bring up this one. Pull up the screen for you here. Purdue beats Alabama 87-78. This was just one of those typical – again, Alabama shot so poorly in the first half. I believe they shot 11%. Uh, in the first half, really carried by LeBaron Filan, the uh, true freshman guard there. He kind of set the tone. I think made three out of four in the first half, just off the top of my head, really. It, again, Alabama's first half, you felt like they were down two. Yeah, because Lawyer hit a three to end the half to go into halftime. Bama was down two. Yeah, Bama was down 42-40, yep. It's just Alabama shoot, Alabama's shooting in that first half was so poor. Alabama really should have been up, I feel like. They were dominating the boards, especially the offensive boards in the first half, getting some second-chance buckets. You just didn't get a lot from Mark Sears. You really didn't. The guy who stole the show was LeBaron Filan from an Alabama perspective. And then Kaufman Wren, it kept, it kept Penn, uh, Purdue in this game. You, you did, after losing Zach Eady this past season, you're like, all right, Alabama added Clifford and Mort Clifford and Morty, who I think did do a good job guarding him until he got into foul trouble. Um, it I thought he was fine, but Grant Nelson, they saw the mismatch. And Coffin Wren, Matt Painter, and them went after him. Again, I think Nate Oates loves that spot with Grant Nelson finishing it or playing that five spot for Alabama. But sometimes you give up a lot of mass and weight. And if they're letting them play a physical style, which they do at Mackey Arena, it's not going to be good. I mean, he finished with 26 points, 12 of 23 from the field. That was tough to do. Clifford Mori, one of the better defenders, I think, in the SEC, but he's got to stay out of foul trouble. They felt they plugged that place in, that that defensive uh, – they they, miss, they missed that defensive element last year. They haven't. He's just got to play – his feet got to be better, and he cannot get into foul trouble. Second half, Bayman ended up shooting better. They came out, I think, hitting what, six out of their first 11. I mean, again, they improved. The numbers don't look as bad. 31% isn't great, but it was only 11% from three um, in the first half. Turnovers weren't bad for Alabama, as you see, 11, uh, eight, only 11 total turnovers in total for the game. As you can see, this game was back and forth. Six, biggest lead, six. Second half, Purdue got it to 10. Bama was up six with about 10 minutes left in the game, and, was, and Purdue went on a 13-0 run. Sometimes I don't understand why Nate Oates doesn't call a timeout. You get on a 13-0 run, it was the media timeout. I think it ultimately stopped it. But really, if Alabama's going to go win games like that, they have to have their veterans, guys like Grant Nelson, guys like Mark Sears, step up uh, and win this game. Or at least play better. Maybe not win. Again, this is the second longest home winning streak in the country. Mackey Arena is one of the hardest places to go play. You're playing two of the best guards in the entire country. And then one of the big guys had one of their best games that you're not even expected in a matchup. You thought you had the advantage in the front court. And you did on the boards at times. But I think overall – I mean, Trey Kaufman Wren, you weren't expecting him with 26 points and eight over, overall rebounds. You, you, you just weren't. Bama just nine for 29 from beyond the arc, 31. That, it's just not expected. They have not shot the ball well all year. I think it'll come on at some point. It just, where does Chris Youngblood fit into this? The South Florida transfer, uh, been out with tight root surgery. He'll be back probably towards the end of December by the start of conference playing January. It'll be interesting to see how he. Fits in that because the starting lineup was Stevenson, Nelson, Clifford, Amore, Mark Sears, and the Trail Wright. So, again, 
I mean, it is what it is. If Alabama just shot a little better, they probably win this game, and they'll tell you that. If you're an Alabama fan, don't panic. I still think this is the most talented roster, deepest roster in college basketball. I, I, I do. It just – the continuity feels off a little bit. The continuity just feels off a little bit. They had some guys miss some of the early fall practice. I mean, Grant Nelson being one of them. So you could kind of tell some of that's not there. Grant Nelson looks a fish out of water at times. Like he's forcing it. Like when he's not playing on well on defense, you saw the very next possession. When you go back and watch the game, he picked up a charge. Like he's just, you could tell frustration, shooting off balance. I, I think they're going to be fine. This unit, again, is a very talented team. It's just, again, they're going through a tough schedule. They get Illinois on Wednesday. They go to Vegas. They play Houston. They play Rutgers. They go at North Carolina here soon. Creighton, it's a NATO conference schedule, folks. It's a NATO, not or sorry, NATO non-conference schedule. Bama's going to be fine. They're going to get tested early. They may mount some, probably another loss or two than we probably expected. But again, this is the transfer portal, guys. These bat, these lineups are not cohesive right now because everybody's kind of sh- still trying to figure out their role. I would say the big surprise, though, you got to be fired up for it. You have a true one in LeBaron Filan, who's an explosive athlete. That his shots coming into his, own, he's coming on as well. But eighty-seven, seventy-eight. Uh, Purdue over Alabama. Nothing to really hang your hat on. It's just a tough road game, you know. And you, like Nate Oak says, no one says it more than him. We want to get exposed to find out what the weaknesses of our team um, is if you're Nate Oak. Florida beats Florida State. I mean, this was a Walter Clayton the third game if I've ever seen it, folks. I mean, he was totally just in his zone uh, the other night against Florida State. Now, Florida could have probably separated and ran away with a little more turnovers, though. But let's go to the team stats first. Again, Walter Clayton, 25 points, 8 for 15, 5 for 5 from the field, uh, free throw line. Florida shot 52%, 35% from three-point range. Felt like they were in control at half. Felt like they were in control a little bit at half. Um, overall, though, I mean, you, you got to be fired up about what you see there. I, was a solid, I thought Florida State was solid. But the thing that stood out to Florida is, like, Man, whoever their strength and conditioning coach is, like, they got a lot of good mass on that team. Elijah Martin's a guy that's going to finish at the rim. You like what they do overall. I do like this Florida team, all but whatever happened off the court with um, Todd going to them. I'm not going to get into that. But I think overall, it, it was a good game held. Florida State to 38.6% from the field, 35% from three-point range. Florida State got on a little run there at the end to make this a little closer than it probably was. But you never felt in doubt. You never, this game was never in doubt. Florida was up 12 and a half. The thing if you're Florida you want to cut down is, and it's why Florida State was allowed to stay in the game, 19 turnovers. That, 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 that's that's got to that's change. That, 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 that's got to change for sure. You'd like to see Alex Condon on defense step up a little bit, 36 points in the paint from that perspective. Going to the box scores, look at the individual players. Again, I mentioned Walter Clayton, the uh, junior. Elijah Martin, the FAU transfer, phenomenal job. 17, 7 for 16 from the field, 3 and 9 from beyond the arc. Um, who else? We look? Will Richard hit some big shots when you went back and watched the game and was watching it live. I think the Sam Alexis kid is another good player there. His profile, I think he does a good job. You teach Chattanooga transfer. Florida's deep. They got, again, I, even some of the guys that are back, whoever the strength and conditioning coach did a phenomenal job. They change a lot of their bodies. They're a physical team that is going to really, I mean, what was the rebound advantage in this? I, when you watch the game, I, the, what took me away was obviously Walter Clayton and then just the physicality of just Florida. What were, what were the rebounds in this? Let's see. 47-29 just dominated. That's what I'm talking about, dude. Florida this year, Alex Condon and them, they're going to do their job. And again, it's not just him. It's just they're going to muscle people around. And if Walter Clayton's doing what he's doing, they're going to win a bunch of basketball games, guys. I, I like Florida. The more I see them watch, uh, the more I see them play. 13-point win, 87-74. to 74. But this game was probably not even as close as the score indicated, if we're being honest. And I thought it was a solid Florida State team. Really don't have much more to add to that. But Florida, no, you, you got to be fired up. You got to be fired up uh, about that one. And Florida goes and plays in the uh, – Let's, see, let's look at the schedule real fast. They play just giving you their upcoming matchups across the board here. Oh, they go play in that Disney Invitational in Orlando. That's what they do. They get Wake, they get Wake Forest in that, and then Wichita State. Um, after that, you still got Virginia, Arizona State, North Carolina in non-conference play. So I, I think Florida's going to come out of non-conference play with a loss or two, maybe. Florida, Florida's set up well. Florida's set up well to go have a uh, good run, get in the league play, get above 500, and get a good seed in the NCAA tournament. I like this basketball team. They're about where I thought they would be. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see that. And if you're a Gator fan, you got to be fired up to see that as well. Texas A&M, it's a big bounce back win. Big bounce back win on Friday night. 
against Ohio State. Remember, remember, folks, this is an Ohio State team. This is an Ohio State team who beat Texas, the team across the state, open and night on, and in Vegas. So I, the thing that made you the most fired up about this, if you are a Texas A&M fan, is you really got to like what Wade Taylor did. I mean, just quoting Wade Taylor from his post-game press conference, I think we did a pretty good job tonight. They played hard, but our defensive scheme and intensity overwhelmed them. We came to play that. That was a Buzz Williams, Texas A&M vintage win right there. It was like a boa constrictor win with a 78-64 win, just sucking the life at them. You could tell they came out with an edge. They knew they dropped that UCF game first night. Um, and about after the first five minutes, this game was in complete control, folks. I'm going to share the box uh, score for you here. I, you were This game was in complete control. I mean, A&M kind of dominated from start to finish. Again, A&M holding Ohio State to 33% from the field, 26% from beyond the arc, out-rebounded them. Uh, and A&M had a couple more turnovers. But overall, it kind of really felt like a true Buzz Williams, Texas A&M type win. And I, I felt really good about him. I bet on this on Friday night. So I'm like, they got to have a bounce back win. It's at home. Ohio State, they have their attention. They're ranked in the top 20. They've beaten another SEC team in Texas this year. That, that, that's where you really had to sit out. I think Zerk Phelps is started to step up early through four games for Texas A&M. Wade Taylor doing his thing. They like getting stuff off the bench. 12 points from Henry Coleman. Six boards overall. Manny Obasiki that does a phenomenal job off the bench. I do like this Texas A&M lineup. I do when they're playing well. I think it just is what it is with Buzz Williams. Sometimes when they're not hitting shots, they're turning the ball over. Yeah, they can be beat by anybody. But when they have that edge, like they had on Friday night, when they had that edge at Reed Arena, which I think we all kind of felt because we knew, like, hey, you know Buzz was harping on. Guys, we've started off slow the last two years. we got to get better. And this is a game at home that you shouldn't say you can't afford to lose. It's just you're leaving some meat on the bone by not getting a top 25 win at home. It's going to help you in Kim Palm. This is going to be a game unless Ohio State totally folds. And, again, I know Purdue beat Alabama, but I'm not totally sold on the Big Ten this year. I think it's a big win for Texas A&M, Buzz Williams. you got to be fired up about that. Schedule coming up, Southern University this week, Oregon, Creighton coming down the latch. Wake Forest. Wake Forest plays a couple of SEC teams. They played Bama in exhibition in an exhibition game that they dropped. They get Florida. Obviously, they get AM matchup against Texas Tech, Purdue, playing a couple SEC teams as well. So it's kind of the action you're seeing before we get into conference play before they tip off the first game against Texas. But I thought this was I thought AM was the big winner over the uh over the weekend, if I'm gonna be completely honest. I thought I thought AM was the big winner. That was the one you needed. You got it home. You came out with the edge, and after about the first five minutes, you put this one to bed. Georgia outlast the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech on Friday night. I thought overall here, this game, big win in year three for Mike White. Uh, Asa Newell looking good. Tyron Lawrence looking good. I think this is a sleepy lineup. I'm pro- I, was, I was high on them going into the year, but probably impressed me a little more than I've seen as well. I mean, R.J. Godfrey, I think, does, did some good things. Um, again, he only finished with four points, but just his presence out there, the Clemson transfer. I like what I'm seeing from him. Pulling up the box score for you here one sec. All right, pulling it up. Yeah, I mean, I thought overall, I mean, pull up team stats here. Here we go. So, Phil, Phil goal percent, 46%, three-point line. That's got to get better. You're going to have to shoot better. People are just going to kind of maybe drop in a zone and see what you can do if guys like Silas, Silas Demery and Blue Kane aren't shooting well. They held Georgia Tech in, in check only 69 points. I thought Tech could have ran away with it, or Georgia could have ran away with this one a little more. But Tech made a run late and pushed, had a couple and ones that kept them in the game. Turnovers, you'd like to get it down in single digits. But I thought overall, again, you see the largest lead, 15. It kind of felt like that, right? 10 to 12-point lead. It was, I know it got it, it got a little hairy towards the end. But I thought overall, though, it was not a bad performance. Again, Asa Newell, 14 points off 6 of 12 shooting, uh, one from three from beyond the arc, 10 points from Blue Kane. Silas Demery with 18. I think Tyron Lawrence, the Vanderbilt transfer, is played in this league, played a bunch of minutes. He's going to help as well. I like the uh, serial kid. Uh, I thought Samato, uh serial kid did a really good job. The kid from Nigeria, 6'11", 260, as you can see. I thought he did a really good job. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. I think I am there because I remember watching the game and someone pronounced it there. I, I apologize from that perspective. But nine points, four rebounds. You're taking that off the bench. And then my guy, LaFew, who, who they report, who they faced last year and got him from the trench portal because he had a massive night against Georgia last year and not got to play 11 points. Three from 10, uh, 0 for 6 from beyond the arc, which is surprising because I thought he was going to be one of their better shooters. Again, that's just one night, though. 
I, I like this team, though. I really do. I, I like this team. I think they're going to be in that bubble conversation across the board. Is Georgia Tech going to be great? No. I mean, they lost to North Florida, who Georgia beat. I mean, North Florida um, had beaten Georgia Tech and South Carolina, and they, they lost to Georgia. But still, a solid team, solid Georgia Tech team. You're getting in non-conference play. Their next two big matches, you got Marquette and you got Rick Patino's Johnnies, St. John's. And then obviously you get Notre Dame, Grand Canyon, who was an NCAA tournament team last year. So they have some challenges for they step up in uh, conference play in January for they play at Ole Miss. But I think overall, though, you got to be fired up about where Georgia is. If you're a Georgia fan in year three for Mike White, those are the games you need to win. Now, hey, what can you do against some of these Big East teams and Marquette and St. John's? I think that's going to be the big question. You're about to go get in Big East territory. Let's see what you can do. But I, I, I don't think you get – I think it's a pretty deep lineup. I really do. I think it goes about – seven, eight deep. I mean, like you said, you got the starting five, Godfrey, Newell, Kane, Demery, Lawrence, then you got LaFue, Serial, and then we'll all play as well. As long as they can stay somewhat healthy, I think Georgia's going to be right there. Again, it's way too early in November to be breaking it down, but I do like this team across the board. Uh, let's get to the next one. Well, Saturday, I, th I thought this was a very under-the-radar win in the league because the Colorado State last year, guys, was an NCAA tournament team. They were an NCAA tournament team, and Ole Miss gets the 84-69 win. And it really – I mean, they, Colorado State, if you went back and – well, I had to go back and watch the replay. They cut it to nine. They cut it to single digits, like, like five minutes left. But it really felt like there was really no getting back. I saw some people say Ole Miss held on. I don't really think they held uh, held on. I, I, I don't. I think Ole Miss controlled this game. Three-point shooting is going to be something you got to be a little – I mean, it, it stepped up. They finished up with 47%. They did. But I think just they can go cold at times, and, that, and that's where I would get a little concerned about. Overall, the numbers, you're just breaking down the box score. It's phenomenal. Just little spurts, um, they'll go cold. They'll go cold at times. Juju Murray, Letterman scoring, uh, two from three from behind the arc, four from six from beyond. They really need Sean Padula to get going. More, more shots. Only two from beyond the arc is not going to be good enough. I thought Malik Dia did a good job, 11 points, five boards. They need a little bit. Matthew Murrell coming back from an injury, 10 points in his first real 32 minutes, most minutes of the season. I thought I, I thought that's good. I see some people being like, we want more than Morrell. Well, he's coming off an injury. Be like, well, is he getting more money off NIL? Is that distracting him? I wouldn't say that. I just, I just It's not time to say that. Don't press the panic button yet. I just think he's working himself back from injury. I think this lineup is really good defensively when Michael Brown-Jones is in. I, I do. I think he's one of the better defenders on this team. I mean, big, long kid. Uh, I think he does a phenomenal job sitting there at 6'8", 225. I, I think they're better defensively there at times. I think when you're playing Jamon Brakefield at times, he, he's a little bit of a liability. So I think this is a big win, though, because, again, Colorado State, guys, it's a respectable basketball program. They've been really good so far the last few years. I think this was an NCAA tournament team from last year or not, I think. I think it could be this year. It was last year. And Ole Miss gets a big one in South Haven. I don't think really many people are there. It looked pretty empty on a football Saturday. But I thought, nonetheless, big win for uh, uh, for Chris Beard and the boys. I, I thought this was a good, solid win. No one's really going to talk about it. But I thought this was probably the second-best win of the weekend after um, – after Texas A&M beating Ohio State, if we're going to be honest. And I like this Ole Miss lineup. I think this is their most complete game of the season. I mean, through a short four-game season so far, you really liked what they got to do. I like the starting five. All, Almost all of them outside of Padua, four out of the five starters were in double figures. So, I mean, you really do have to like that. Uh, you like what they did on the on the boards as well. I mean, again, they got out-rebounded, but it wasn't bad. Again, just these slumps a little bit, these five- to six-minute droughts they go in. You, you would like to see that improve, but I'm hot on this Ole Miss team. I like this Ole Miss team a lot, 84-69. Again, I think the second, second biggest win of the weekend. Then out of the other big ones, um, before we – well, we got one more time. Mississippi State yesterday rallying past, rallying past Utah. It was not a pretty first half, folks. Let's call a spade a spade here. It was not a pretty first half. They, I mean, they were down 11 in the first half and had to surge back. I mean, I, give Mississippi State, give Chris Jans and them credit. Defensively, that first half, they just were not getting back on transition D, taking some bad shots. But, man, it, it, it's Josh Hubbard, and we know this, is not one of the best pure shooters we've ever seen in Mississippi State history. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, shooter. And Mississippi State's had some guys in the past that could, it could really light it up. 
uh, going back to the Rick Stansberry days. I thought Cam Matthews came in down there, had had some big plays for him as well. Keyshawn Murphy off the bench, 18 points. Um, let me pull up the box score for you so you can have a visual, a visual as well. Uh, Cam Matthews off the bench, I thought, gave a little bit of a spark to Mississippi State as well. And then Keyshawn Murphy, 18 points. He's the one off the bench. Sorry, Cam Matthews had four boards. I mean, look at Keyshawn Murphy, 18 points. You didn't, you felt that in the second half. 18 points, 14 boards, man, in 27 minutes. That, 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 that's impressive. And it's a solid Utah team who came in undefeated as well. This game was in South Haven the next day after Ole Miss played. But it felt like, man, Mississippi State's going to drop this one in half. I remember watching it. I was like, dude, they're going to drop this. Then they outscore them 50 to 34 in the second half in a, in a big win. Big. That's a springboard game potentially for teams like Mississippi State. It, it, that was. I mean, they need some other guys to step up in that starting lineup at the guard spots. Claudel Harris is another guy they're going to wait on. Kanye Clary, the Penn State transfer. I think those are the two guys. Riley Kugel, the Florida-Kansas transfer. They need – I thought Kugel played fine today, 12 points, 4 from 10, uh, shooting 0 for 4 from beyond the arc. He's just got to be consistent. They, the, they need someone like Kugel, Clary, and Harris to help Josh Hubbard. We know Josh Hubbard's going to do what Josh Hubbard does. He, he's kind of like Mark Sears, Janai Brubin. I know Sears didn't have a consistent game uh, against Purdue on Friday night. But, again, I think Hubbard's kind of in that classification of, yeah, I know what I'm going to get with him every night. But I thought this was a big win. You're down, ele- you're down 11 in a weird Sunday afternoon game. It, it's kind of a home game for you. you got your crowd decorated all around the stadium, all around the arena in South Haven where uh, the Memphis G League team plays. What were they? The uh, – Forgot what the name of the team was, the Memphis G, but that's where they played. But Mississippi State, give them credit, man. Let's look a little bit ahead to this schedule, who they have left in non conference. They go at SMU, UNLV, Pitt, McNeese. They play Memphis. Not an overly league uh, non conference schedule for they get in a conference play against South Carolina, but I was impressed. I was impressed. This was an impressive win for Mississippi State, in my opinion, just overall across the board. Uh, and then the last one, before we get into the big one, then we just randomly go, then we'll just go around and look at the other view, uh, scores. Gamecocks fall in Bloomington, folks. The South Carolina Gamecocks fall in Bloomington. I mean, we kind of expect this. You, you got off to a rough start. You got off to a rough start right out of the gate. You're down 11 and a half. Uh, Colin Murray Boyles just really can get nothing going here, guys. And again, I, I think that was the game plan of Indiana there, Coach Woodson, to, to totally get them out of their game plan if you, I think teams are going to take the approach with South Carolina this year. Let's double Colin Murray Bulls. Let's get him out of the game. Who can beat us? I thought Nick Nick Pringle, the Alabama Trenchers, stepped up in his absence. I mean, 13 points, 11 rebounds. I thought he stepped up in his absence. Just I, overall, though, I just don't know where a lot of this scoring is going to come from from this team. I think Miles Studi is going to have to consistently play well. Jamari Thomas, Jacoby Wright. Those guys are going to have to play well. And they're going to have to have, I mean, again, the band, Morris Yugasuk, I mean, from the kid from Finland, I think he can do a phenomenal job, but can you get that consistently off the bench? I don't know. Maybe you can. Maybe you can. I don't really think you can, though. And maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you shoot 38% from the field, 27% from beyond the arc, only 65% from the free throw line. Look at some team stats here. How many turnovers suck your line in this game? Yeah. I mean, again, you'd always love to be in the single digits, folks. But again, 12 isn't. Terrible, but Indiana controlled this game. Very similar if you wanted to compare it to the Texas A&M and Ohio State game. You just feel like South Carolina was really never in this game really much. What just Colin Burry Bulls could never get going just due to foul trouble, whatever it may be. Give Indiana credit for a good game plan. And outside of that, I don't think South Carolina is currently ready right now for someone else to just kind of take that reign and make no, give me the basketball. I'm going to carry it. They just don't have that right now. They sit at two and two. I think Lamont Paris is a good basketball coach, folks. I think they're only going to continue to improve. Just right now, it's early in the season. It's just it's not it's not there. They, they miss a little bit of like a Michi Johnson at times, who's now at Ohio State. And Michi had his own issues at times. But I think overall it's tough to – it's tough to judge them too early. I mean, at Indiana, Assembly Hall is a tough place to play. I mean, top 20 team, ranked 16th. It's just – I don't know. It is what it is. Anyone who thought South Carolina was going to go win this game, I think, was a little uh, – a little, a little naive. A little naive. I mean, Indiana's favored by eight and a half going into this one. You just – Lamont, Paris, and them know this. They got to figure out who's our next guy after Colin Murray Bulls. If like he can't go, who can give us some points? You see some double figures here from Nick Pringle, Miles Studi. It's not terrible. It's just you can't get off. If you get off to that slow of a start, was it like seventeen to one run? I think in the right off the bat, off the, I went back and replay. Watched so many games today on the Sunday. 
Uh, they, they all kind of running together. This They got off to a terrible start because I couldn't watch this one live. It, it, on the road, in, in a team like South Carolina, if you get off to that slow of a start, you're not going to win many basketball games. So the start's got to be key. And when Kyle Murray Bulls is kind of just taken out of the game, two points, that's not going to ha- happen a lot. Uh, only five shots, 19 minutes. That's not going to happen a lot, but it was the recipe for disaster uh, in Bloomington. Uh, and then just going a little bit around oh, – stop sharing. Just going around the rest of the league. Let me put it in there. We would – you had a couple – again, no big matchup, marquee matchups, but, again, just wanted to talk about it. Let's go. We, we went over all the matchups on Friday night, so we will – Go to Saturday night's matchups. Again, that's South Carolina, Indiana was on Saturday. Ole Miss, Colorado State, we talked about that. Oklahoma, 85 64 win over the Hatters from Stetson. I mean, Stetson's one and three. I mean, thing you took away from this, I think Kobe Elvis is going to be a consistent guy 24 points, nine for 15, four from eight from beyond the arc. It's tough to take a lot from this. They forced a lot of turnovers in this game. Stetson's just not very good. You couldn't take a lot from this one, but you're never going to turn down a 21 uh, point win. Jackson uh, Vanderbilt beats Jackson State 94-81. A, a win's a win, but you don't really like this one because I think Ken Palm may punish Vanderbilt a little bit with this one. You know what I mean? I mean, the line was 27 and a half, and they kind of won. I mean, they struggled. It, it didn't struggle, but just didn't put them away like they should have. Jackson State, Mo Williams, former point guard Alabama's the head coach there. They're 0-4. They're not a good basketball team. This wasn't Vanderbilt's best overall effort. It was they, – they shot well, just – I thought overall, you going back and watching the highlights, it, 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 it could have been it could have been a lot better. It, it overall, could have been a lot better. They got dominated on the boards at times. Consider, yeah, I mean, 43-32, they got dominated by Jackson Jackson State. I, I mean, that's just that's that's tough. That's tough to look at if you're a Vanderbilt coming. In. That's what would concern me there. Ken Palm's going to penalize them with this loss. They will, but no, Vanderbilt gets the 94-81 win over Jackson State and Mo Williams. Texas, poor Mississippi Valley State, got hammered um, early in the week by Missouri and then get hammered at Texas. I mean, Trey Johnson's going to do his own thing. some point, though, I mean, you can't take a lot from this. They're one in three, Mississippi Valley State, the Delta Devils. It's just, again, outside of Trey Johnson, someone's going to have to go score some points against other good competition. I thought Arthur Coloma was good the other night, six boards, 18 points. Not a lot you can take away from this one. Julian Larry, he needs to be a guy that kind of steps up, be consistent. Jordan Pope, those are the guys that you look at. Like, hey, who help, Who else can help Trey Johnson? Johnson went 18 points, six from nine, three from five, beyond the arc. That's it from Saturday's action. And then Sunday's action, again, we talked about Mississippi State. Utah, other one, Tennessee beating Austin P, who looked like a pretty solid team. They came in three and one, one and one, 103 68. Good performance from Rick Barnes and this team. But this was really, this was an Igor Milicic Jr. game 23 points, 11 for 14 from behind the arc, only shot one three, 0 for one. I, I thought overall Tennessee played pretty well when I went back and watched the replay 63% from the field, 35% from three point line. I mean, you'd like that to get up, but still is what it is. Uh, only had you had 11 turnovers like that to be down a little bit. And then from a rebound perspective, you dominated 43 to 25. And I didn't think that was a bad Austin P governor's team, if I'm going to be honest. So you're going to take that. Those are the, uh, that's what you should do from a kid. Again, Kim Palm's going to penalize you if you really don't win like they think you should. I think Vanderbilt's going to get hit with that. This one could hurt them on selection Sunday. And I hate talking about selection Sunday on in November, on November 17th. But these are the kind of games like Tennessee, it's not going to penalize them. I don't think anyone thought it was. But you go out there and dominate like that, that's what happens. Like, you're not going to get penalized. This is what you do again, that, that kind of competition. They were favored by 27 and a half. They, they won by 30-something. So, I mean, give them credit. Again, can't take a ton from this, but I did think you could be fired up about Felix Okapara, seven boards, Igor. I mean, it, outside of 23 points, had nine boards. Sakai Ziegler dropped 19 points. The bench, you like what you see from Cade Phillips, and that is someone you, when you go watch Rick Barnes' press conferences, he's like, we want to see Cade Phillips be consistent. Be consistent. He will be an X factor in our front court this year. So I think you're glad to see that. But that is the other win across the SEC. So we hit all Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night's matchups across the board. We had two on Sunday. We hit all four of them on Saturday. What, yeah, two, three, no, all five of them on Saturday. And then the four, the best night was Friday night, all four of them on Friday night, guys. But we got a hell of a week ahead of us. Feast week is just a week away. That'll be a, a lot of phenomenal non-conference matchups. We got some good ones this week. I'll be bringing you that action, those reviews um, throughout the day. Go join my show every Monday 
Uh, and Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, Dave talks ball. We obviously talk college football. We talk college basketball uh, as well, guys. But I appreciate you joining us on this SEC unfiltered college basketball reaction, folks. Phenomenal three days. We went a little long, 30 minutes, but guys, three days of college basketball action. I think it's the best conference in the league. I'm your college basketball analyst coming at you from the SEC Unfiltered channel. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, guys, for all the phenomenal SEC content that comes at you uh, from everybody at the SEC Unfiltered, fam uh, Unfiltered family, guys. But for Dave Shumate, you phenomenal week.